everybody. I'm Troy. It's back. It's me, Troy. I'm back. Uh, Steve's off on a little trip today, so you are with just me. Um, today we're going to be talking about using vermicast or vermicompost once you've harvested it. Uh, first, I was going to just mention that uh, less than three weeks now, it's what 17 days away, the NC State Vermiculture Conference is coming up and you can attend in person this year or for the first time you can attend online. Um, and I would encourage anybody to check that out. It's uh, Saturday, October 22nd and Sunday, October 23rd. And I'll be speaking on compost teas and extracts on the Sunday, the 23rd. Um, I don't think we have any other reminders coming up right now. Steve hadn't mentioned anything. Um, he might be joining in later. He was on a little trip for his uh, for piloting and uh, he was supposed to be getting in and possibly joining us for the latter part of this. So. Uh, if he's got anything, we can ask him then. Otherwise, I'm going to try and remember to do everything today, share my screen, take down the banner so you guys can see everything. So let me get all of that done. Give me one second here. One second. All right, I've got the banners down. One more. One second, one second. All right, I'm gonna start sharing my screen here and we'll talk about vermicompost or vermicast. One more button to hit here. Okay. So yes, today we're going to talk about how to use vermicast. If you joined us back in July, a couple months ago, we talked about harvesting your worm bin. Um, so after you harvest your worm bin and you've got some vermicast uh, saved up, we're going to talk about how you can use that. So we'll go through uh, first just briefly the benefits of vermicast or vermicompost, and then we can talk about how you can use it in soil mixes and then for top dressing on lands and soils, then side dressing perennials and annuals and then talk about how you can use it for a compost extract, and we can go through a question and answer at the end. So there's a reason it's called black gold. Um, that's the most popular term for vermicompost. Um, the reason for that is that it's going to be especially full of beneficial life. So uh, all the soil food web characters that we've talked about in uh, blog posts and other Wiggle Wednesdays um, are going to be chewing away at all this uh, material. And then as worms chew through the material, they've got microorganisms in their guts, just like we do, that they're inoculating their poop with even more beneficial life. So um, that's why vermicompost is even better than regular compost, because you've got these additional, uh, lots of more additional microorganisms in there. And they are going to be helped in helping to provide nutrients and minerals. Um, their poop is going to also be gr full of growth hormones and growth regulators. So the growth hormones are going to be beneficial for getting them going and getting them started in life. And then the regulators are going to be auxins, which um, kind of which regulate their growth in a way that it's hindering growth in, in a certain way. We'll get into how that um, plays a part in our making soil mixes or using vermicast. Uh, they're going to be full of humus and organic matter. So Lots of, lots of soils nowadays because of tilling and chemical use and things like that. Uh, and because of the way we've managed land are really lacking organic matter. So using vermicompost or vermicast is gonna help get this good organic matter back into the earth. And on top of anything, it's free fertilizer. For the most part, you've paid for the worms and paid for the worm bin, but uh, as you keep you know, using food scraps and things like that, you're basically, uh, using waste material to turn into free fertilizer for your garden or your plants. So first up, we're going to talk about uh, soil mixes and how you can use vermicast in soil mixes. So you can use it in all types of soil blends from people who are doing um, like market gardening and using seed trays to do seed starting or making blocks to do seed starting. You can come up with various recipes um, for Seed, starting your seeds, either vegetable seeds or flower seeds or herb seeds or something like that. Um, you can use vermicast to make potting soils. So um, 
more geared for just, you know, a house plant or adding soils to your house plants when you're up potting them into larger pots. Uh, you can also use vermicast to in a raised bed garden mix. So if you build a raised bed garden or purchase one and need to fill that up, um, you're likely not going to be buying bags of potting soil because you're going to want something in a um, more bulk material. So you can have a uh, Vermicast can be used in a bulk material like that to make a soil mix similar to the potting soils and use that in a raised bed gardening mix. So as far as the growth regulators, which I mentioned, you want to stick to using 20% vermicast or less. Um, if you read the book uh, Vermiculture Technology, that's full of all kinds of experiments that were done with various ratios of vermicast to vermicompost where they were adding 10%, 20%, 30%, 40% on up to, I don't know if they even got up to 90%, but it was at least up to like 60% where the rest was maybe peat moss or something like that along with this vermicast. So as they got into 30, 40, 50% of the mix of the volume being vermicast due to these growth regulators, um, they were hindering the growth of the plants. And so they actually saw a decrease in health of the plants as there was more vermicast added. And that was because of these growth regulators, but it, at 10 and 20% of the volume, they saw incredible growth, um, especially compared to other components like compost or just, you know, regular um, potting soil mixes that didn't necessarily have the micro microbial life in there. So whenever you're using it and using it in some type of mix like that, you want to stick to 20% or less. So 10 to 20%, I would say. And that's all due to those growth regulators that are um, contained within vermicompost, especially. So on top of soil mixes, you can use just straight up vermicompost by itself without mixing it into anything and use that for top dressing lands and soils. I'm going to take a drink quick. It's an excellent way to add fertility to land. So again, um, I mentioned that many soils are lacking organic matter. So it's good to use the um, material form of rather than like a liquid form of vermicompost um, because you're getting both that good organic matter and humus down into the soil along with all that beneficial biology, nutrients and minerals. So um, lawns people really care a lot about their lawns and having a green lawn so much so that there are chemical fertilizer companies that strictly come out to lawns and spray them um, and you can replace that type of service with just using uh, vermicast along with possibly a liquid form of vermicast for compost so a compost tea or compost extract so along with lawns very similar are going to be sports fields or turf areas um, golf courses are on there. That's on there later on the list, but that's going to be very similar or pastures. So if you have a horse pasture, cow pasture, or just regular pasture, goats, anything with even maybe don't even have animals that you're going to be turning it into hay or straw, this is going to be give you um, even healthier plant material to feed to animals. Uh, so by adding more microbial life through vermicast to soils, you're going to get more nutrient, better nutrient uptake into the plants, not only have healthier plants, but uh, by having more nutrient filled plants and crops, you're going to have healthier animals, including yourself. So uh, with that is cropland. So whether that be like a market garden that someone's intensively planting a small part piece of land or someone with a monocrop agriculture like soybeans or pumpkins or something on a very large scale. You can use vermicast to top dress those lands. Um, it would be good, you know, like in the fall or first thing in the spring before you're planting anything, you could go out and get this good microbial life spread into the soil. Um, and with any of these, you want to stick to about four, at least uh, four tons per acre. Um, that's very minimal that at four tons per acre, you're really not going to be even seeing much. And you can go up to even 10, uh, 10 tons per acre, I would say. Uh, I'm not sure how much more you would want to go with that because of the growth regulators, regulators that I've mentioned. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of research done on large scale things like that using vermicompost or at least things that I've, any research that I've found. But um, I have definitely heard of people using four tons per acre getting results. Uh, so, you know, on a small, 
yard, you could purchase, you know, just one ton bag, uh, get it shipped, and then use some type of spreader that you're spreading that material out over to your lawn, um, water it in, or even then make a compost extract and water that over to your soil to get even more biology going. So on top of top dressing in a similar fashion, you can use it to side dress annuals and perennials. So top dressing, I'm strictly referring to like things that don't necessarily have large vegetation, um, more like lawns and turf and bare soil and things like that. But um, you can use it to side dress plants. So any plant's going to benefit from vermicast. Um, people think of side dressing, especially with heavy feeders in the garden, like a tomato plant, especially that's what I've got the visual here for. Um, so when your plant starts to bloom and then fruit, they've already taken a lot from the soil just to put on a lot of vegetation. If you can think of how much vegetation a, a tomato plant is going to put on. So they're pulling a lot from the soil and then you could come in halfway through the season or once they start to bloom, um, add a couple, you know, maybe a half a cup per plant, depending on the size of the plant, but about a half a cup per plant or even a little bit less uh, to side dress. And then even halfway through the fruiting season, you could come back with another half cup to side dress those. Uh, any types of fruit, vegetables, herbs, you can do this with uh, if they're showing some uh, deficiencies. It's good to focus on the soil and feeding the soil and getting good things back into the soil so let, to let the soil provide what the plant needs to the plant. Uh, so uh, the ornamentals here, I had a really good example, which I didn't take a picture of, but um, I had a client in the Nashville area who uh, I went and sprayed compost tea on their lawn and they had some dwarf boxwoods, which are, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with boxwoods. They're a very uh, common ornamental plant. Uh, but dwarf boxwoods are especially small. They're just about this big, a little globe, and they were really lacking in health and on their way to dying. Um, they were like a quarter to half of the plant was brown and had brown leaves. Uh, and the owner had mentioned something to me about the plants. And I said, well, you know, let me try something and we'll see what we can do. They're already, you know, not in the greatest health. So if you have to replace them, it looks like you're going to probably have to already anyway. So uh, I sprayed that time and then had scheduled uh, time to come back a month or two later. And for each boxwood, I used half a cup to a cup of vermicompost, uh, spread it right around the root zone of the plant. And then I think it was maybe like six months that I came back for that lawn. And after a certain time period, it was more than a couple months, but it was around at least six months. Uh, I came back and was astonished at the health of all these uh, bo dwarf boxwoods. They had all regained their health. They had put on new growth. Uh, I didn't see any brown dead uh, leaves in it. And uh, that was one of the times that I impressed myself again with uh, just how bi good biology can do. So um, yeah, any types of veggies, fruits, herbs, ornamentals, flowers, even in your house plants. So if you've got ferns or fig trees or whatever type of house plants you can for smaller ones you know one or two gallons just add you know a tablespoon for larger house plants you could use a few tablespoons so maybe three or four tablespoons it really doesn't take much to uh to enhance their growth and enhance their health so any of those things can be synthesized with just a little bit of vermicompost and then lastly you can make vermicompost into a liquid form and use that to spray out over your soils and your plants. Um, I've got a picture of my daughter here when she was three or four, just to show how easy it is that a three or four year old can do it. She loves to help me. So um, it's as easy as taking a five gallon bucket, filling it up with clean water or even a smaller bucket, you know, three gallons, whatever. Uh, for five gallons, you can use two to three cups. So it comes out to about a half a cup per gallon if you were going to be doing something smaller. Um, so you can either put it in a strainer bag and dunk that bag into the water or simply just put the vermicompost into the water and then strain it after you mixed it all. So put it all in the bucket, mix it up real well with your hand. I like to squeeze chunks and really break all that down into a small of particle size that I can. Um, so I'll just stir it for three or five minutes grabbing handfuls, grabbing chunks, working that material, getting it broken down, 
and then strain it out into, I have a backpack sprayer in the picture here. You can use a watering can. Uh, I'm not gonna get into all the details of how to do all that. We've got blog posts and, and videos up on how to uh, do vermicompost uh, application. So uh, backpack sprayer, watering can, anything like that. So what's great about the extract is that you can also use it as a foliar spray as opposed to not being able to put the vermicompost on the foliage of your plants. And then you can use that five gallons on a quarter acre up to a half acre. So we were doing research at Rodale Institute. We did research with five gallons of this per acre and getting results. So I like to go a little bit heavier than that. So five gallons per quarter acre, five gallons per half acre. And that's very doable for anyone on a small scale. But uh, yeah, if you're interested in learning more about vermicompost extract, please check out our blog posts on the urbanwormcompany.com. Otherwise we can move on to questions. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here so I can see you all's questions. All right, uh, give me one second. I gotta go back through and check out this. Uh, someone asked about a link to the event. Um, it's at NC State. You can Google uh, 21st Annual Vermiculture Conference or it's at, I think it's NC State, oh, sorry, uh, composting.ces.ncsu.edu slash vermiculture conference. And I can type that out when I'm done here with the presentation. And then y'all can have that link in the comments section if you want to check that out. Um, somebody said, yay, no banners. Yeah, I'm sorry. A lot of the times when I forget about leaving the banners up. Uh, somebody asked about storing finished castings over the winter. Uh, as far as keeping castings over the winter, you can just keep them in some type of bin. Um, as long as they're not too wet, if they're about about 50%, 40 or 50% moisture, you can keep them in a bin, either covered or uncovered. If they're super wet, you would want to let them dry out some uh, because if you kept them in an airtight container, uh, they're going to likely go anaerobic uh, or keep them in kind of a breathable area. It depends on how humid your house is. So if you have a really dry house, you want to make sure that they're not getting dried out. So it's good to allow them vermicast some breathability along with making sure that they're remaining moist because that moisture is going to keep the microbes active and alive. Um, someone asked about adding molasses to the liquid. I'm talking about a compost extract, not a compost tea. So compost teas is where, are where you add foods. And I wouldn't I recommend adding uh, molasses just because we've already got a lot of bacteria going and those are going to be a bacterial food. And, uh, yeah, go ahead and check out any blog posts so you can learn about the details of that. Um, but yeah, compost extract is simply putting compost in water and extracting the microorganisms off of those. Someone asked, should we prevent um, vermicast from freezing? Um, if it's just vermicast, you know, well, even if it had some worms or worm eggs in there or cocoons in there, uh, it shouldn't be that much of an issue, just like the soils that we have soils are going to freeze and thaw and microbes are just going to go dormant within the soil. It's not like they're going to die from the freezing temperatures. They'll just go dormant. And then once things warm up, they'll come back. So it's not too much of an issue for freezing. Um, the worst thing that you could do with vermicast is to allow it to dry out to, you know, extremely dry out. Then you're going to lose a lot of microbial life because you've lost that moisture. Uh, someone asked, do you think foliar sprays with the vermicast helps with disease, pests, fungus resistance? Yes, it does. So um, by applying a liquid coating of all these microbes to the foliage of your plant, you're basically producing like a sheath that the same thing, like a protective layer with a knife or a sword um, or having like a security force. So it's like having a building with so many security guards surrounding the building that no one's even able to penetrate through that security force because there's so many people there that it won't allow any bad things to come through. So uh, not only will vermicast help with the health of a plant, so a healthier plant is going to be 
more disease resistant anyway, but having all this beneficial life on the surfaces of the plant are going to um, help to fight, uh, help to resist any pests or disease or pathogens that are going to be blowing in through the wind. Uh, somebody asked about adding an aerator to the extract. I'm simply about, uh, talking about mixing up the water, straining it immediately and using it immediately. So you'd want to use it within, you know, 12, 24 hours there, not putting it on air. You could put it on air for 12 to 24 hours. Uh, and that air is just going to help to agitate more, agitate the water more and help to possibly extract more populations of microorganisms. So in the same fashion that if you have uh, hot tea that you're drinking and if you steep the tea for two minutes, you get so many flavonoids that are coming out into the water. Whereas if you steep it for five to six minutes, it becomes much, much stronger because you're pulling that many more flavonoids off. So the extended time period of using an aerator, you could pull like more fungi and things off of the organic matter. Um, but you don't have, have to do that. You could just use it immediately. That's what's great about compost extract. Uh, anyway, that's, uh, I got one more question here. Thoughts on leachate from worms, uh, thoughts. I think they're asking if the leachate is beneficial. Uh, le worm leachate is always a questionable substance. It should be treated as manures. It could be good or it could be bad. Um, because if you've got a worm bin where, uh, I always like to use spinach. If you purchase spinach, it's, there's been how many cases in the past few years of E. coli or salmonella. Um, there's one other one of, um, what do you call it? Spinach that's having those issues that's been recalled. Uh, so think if you have some spinach that has E. coli on there, you put it on top of your worm bin to let them break things down, but maybe you're sprinkling a little bit of water onto that E. coli and then that water is carrying the E. coli down into your vermic uh, into your leachate bin, and then you go and spray that onto your plants, then it's not going to be helpful to you because you're spreading around that E. coli. So um, it also leachate can breed anaerobic microorganisms, which can make um, harmful things to plant like alcohols or phenols. So a leachate can be super stinky and smelly and could be harmful to your plants. So it could be either harmful to plants or people that things that you're spraying out. So yeah, Listeria, thanks. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so leachate is a questionable substance. If you're collecting any leachate, um, dump it somewhere on a soil that you're not really caring much about. Um, a good, a well-managed worm bin should have very little leachate anyway. Uh, and then the other question is, can you apply fresh compost to raised beds at planting? Yeah. Um, so that would be similar to, I, and uh, glad you asked that. I don't know why I didn't mention that in the first place. Um, that's a very good point because I should have mentioned that in, the, in this. So I always recommend to people to inoculate their plants with beneficial life as soon as they can in the plant's life cycle. So either at seeding or if your planting starts. Um, you could sprinkle vermicompost in all the little holes that you've dibbled for your plants if you're planting a vegetable garden. Um, or, well, that's why I was mentioning it in the seed trays, because if you're using starts, you can use vermicast or vermicompost in those seed trays that you're getting that beneficial life going right away. But if you haven't, if you've used a um, commercial potting soil that doesn't have beneficial microbes in there to start your plants, then yes, you could use uh, vermicast to get good life in your soils before you plant seeds or starts. And with that, it looks like I've answered all the questions. Let me check back through here real quick. Um, I believe Steve's going to be back with us next week. And I haven't quite come up with a topic yet for next week. Uh, today was kind of short. Thanks to everybody for joining in. I'll check back to see if you have any other questions. Uh, somebody said, getting ready to do my first harvest, should I use it in my cold frames for winter lettuce or put it in my garden beds? Uh, I would do both. Use it in the cold frames for getting things started and then um, put it in garden beds as well. I mean, it's good to use for any type of plants or planting. So, yeah. Um, thanks for the question. 
anyway, with that, I'm going to end it. Uh, thank you all for joining in and you're welcome. Some different people said, thank you. Uh, I'm going to remember to include the link right when we get off here, I'll put that link down for the uh, vermiculture conference coming up in about two weeks from now. And you can check for that link. Uh, I'm also going to be probably posting about it again on social media. So you can take a look at, uh, Instagram and Facebook, and we'll have the link to the Permaculture Conference on there, but otherwise I'll add it here. But thanks for joining in, and I hope to see you next Wednesday. Thanks, everybody.